This is a production of Cornell University. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, and thanks so much for your introduction, Steve. Uh, I'm going to first introduce my program a little bit. I know that Steve did as well. Um, so we'll do a little bit of an introduction of the resources we have for you. And then I'm gonna define incompatibility and then we'll kind of get into the meat of the talk. And that's where we'll be talking about how to avoid incompatibility issues. So as Steve said, I'm the director and an educator with our program, Cornell Cooperative Extension Pesticide Safety Education Program. We go by CCEP SEP and we were formerly PMEP. Uh, and we've been a leader in pesticide safety education for over 40 years. And you know, Steve mentioned that we provide training, we answer questions, and we serve as an objective source of information about pesticides for both applicators and consumers. And what might be of interest to you is we have applicator certification manuals. Uh, and so we write and publish those manuals, uh, which you can use to study for your certification exam. And you can purchase those online through the Cornell store at the link here. And uh, the manuals of interest to you would include probably fruit and vegetables. So we have category 22 and 23. And we also have the core manual. We also have, uh, in addition to the live talks that I'm giving today, we give talks like this, but we also give uh, on-demand recertification courses that are online. So you can just go to our distance learning center. Uh, you know, this might be a little bit harder to read, but you can see there's a wide variety of talks uh, for recertification credits in New York State and also nine other Northeast states. Um, and they cover core and category topics. So this might be of interest to you if you're looking to get some more credits. And then we also published the Cornell Crop and Pest Management Guidelines. And we're currently selling the 2022 guidelines. Uh, the guidelines that might be of interest to you are probably you know, vegetable, tree fruit, and berry are out, also field crops. Um, and you can purchase those online as well at the link. Okay, so now that I've kind of shown off our program resources a little bit here, um, I do a little bit of housekeeping. So uh, in this talk, there's some pesticide trade names that are included. And the sole purpose of having those trade names in there is to explain common compatibility issues. They're just examples. I'm not endorsing the products mentioned here. And if I don't mention something, it's not because I'm criticizing it. Uh, and please know that you know I'm only sharing sections of the label. You have to read the entire label. Uh, specific to your product before you go to purchase, mix, load, store, or apply it to make sure you're using that product correctly. Okay, now that we've gotten through all that housekeeping, um, let's get into things. So when we think about incompatibility, you know, the first thing I kind of want to zoom out first and really talk about why uh, do we run into this problem and mainly it's tank mixing, right? So let's talk about the benefits of tank mixing first uh, before we get into incompatibility issues. So you know, there are many upsides to tank mixing. Uh, it can help you make more timely applications. You often have a very narrow window of time where your pest is in the correct life stage and weather conditions to allow for you to effectively use chemical controls, right? And mixing multiple products in one application can reduce expenses associated with labor, uh, time, wear, and equipment. And you can also reduce soil compaction um, or crop damage just by not going out as often, right? And you can improve control with tanks mixing by hitting a pest with multiple different products. And then you can also manage multiple pests in one application by, for instance, you know, mixing an herbicide and an insecticide together or combining pre and post emergent herbicides to manage multiple different species of weeds at the same time. So there's a lot of benefits to tank mixing. And you know, before you tank mix, you have to make sure the following things are true. You wanna make sure that none of the pesticide labels prohibit that mix, that the timing is right for efficacy of each pesticide against the target pest, um, that the application method is used, uh, that, that you're using is appropriate for all pesticides in the mix. And you wanna make sure that mixing those pesticides won't lead to incompatibility. And so that's what we're gonna focus on today is the incompatibility piece of it. So first let's define incompatibility so incompatibility occurs when you're mixing two or more pesticide products together, and that negatively influences how the other pesticide products in the tank disperse, mix, and deliver. So basically, incompatibility is where one or more of your pesticide products are no longer effective for pest control because you mix them with another product. And there's two types of incompatibility that we're going to talk about. 
So you've got physical incompatibility. This is kind of the more obvious one, right? It's the failure of pesticide products to stay uniformly mixed in the spray tank. And you're gonna see all sorts of horrible stuff. <laughs> you see in some of these pictures here, the products fail to stay uh, uniformly mixed. So you're seeing separation into layers and putties and paste, clogging of screens and nozzles. Uh, this is difficult to clean and it, it can render the products ineffective or impossible to spray. And then if you have you know, some of that left in your tank, you can actually, those residues can cause injury to your crops later on if it's not cleaned properly. And the other type of incompatibility is chemical incompatibility. And so this occurs when you're mixing two pesticides together or two or more, and the activity of one of those pesticides is reduced. Um, so you, you're gonna see reduced efficacy or even undesirable crop damage. Um, and the only indication often of chemical incompatibility is the lack of results or efficacy, okay? So you, if you've ever mixed a tank application in the field that was mysteriously ineffective, that's probably due to a chemical incompatibility. It's very rarely visible. So regardless of which type of incompatibility you have, uh, there's really negative consequences, right? You might have to repeat the applications to control your pests or even switch products if repeat application violates the label direction on that product. If you applied, spilled, or have to dispose of the mixture, then the resultant mixture, that can be considered an environmental contaminant, right? Because it didn't provide any benefit for pest control, and now it's in the environment. Um, incompatibility wastes time, money, uh, and product. And as we talked about a little bit, it can damage your equipment and it can also injure your crop, uh, for example, with phytotoxicity. There's a lot of obvious incentives to avoiding incompatibility. And so that's what we're going to talk about now. And this is just kind of an overview of what we'll talk about today, uh, mostly focusing on avoiding incompatibility. So we'll talk about only mixing a few things, reading the label, mixing in order, mixing correctly, knowing your carrier properties, conducting jar tests, accounting for multiple factors. And then finally, we'll talk about resolving incompatibility if it should happen to you. Uh, but most of what we'll talk about today is avoiding it. <clears throat> So the first way to avoid compatibility issues uh, is to only mix a few products. Mixing fewer products reduces your chance of incompatibility. So to get into why this is, let's talk about what goes into your tank. We've already discussed, you know, you're putting pesticides in your tank and we're talking about things like herbicides, fungicides, insecticides. Depending on a pesticide formulation, uh, they might respond differently to things like temperature, water, pH, storage conditions, uh, mixing in the carrier, and mixing with other pesticide products. So let's talk about what makes up a pesticide. If you remember back to your core training, a pesticide formulation uh, is the active ingredient plus the inert ingredients, right? Together that makes up the formulation. So for example, if we have Roundup Pro, it's a broad spectrum post emergence herbicide, and the pesticide uh, product name is Roundup Pro. The active ingredient is glyphosate, and you can see highlighted here, it's, it's a specific salt form. And then 58 or 59% of this product is listed as other ingredients, and those are the inert ingredients. You're probably familiar with a lot of these inert ingredients, um, but you know what they do is they improve efficacy. So the active ingredient is the thing that's actually preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating the pest. And the inert ingredients actually improving efficacy, uh, shelf life, application ease, and applicator safety. Uh, and it can do things like reduce degradation from sunlight, for example, or help penetrate the active ingredient into a weed. And so inert ingredients include things like solvents and anti-drift and wetting agents, um, antifreeze and pH buffers, defoamers. So when you're tank mixing two or more pesticides together, you know, when you think about how complicated the formulation can be, it makes sense that um, simply because of those complex formulations, you might see incompatibility because it's often the inert ingredients that can pose those incompatibility issues. Now think about everything else that goes into your tank, okay? You've got fertilizers, macronutrients, micronutrients, plant growth, uh, growth regulators, spray dyes, biostimulants, okay? And all all of these substances can interact with one another and with the water and with your pesticides and the carrier's pH um, and the temperature and the mineral content resulting in incompatibility. Okay, so this is really why if you can reduce the number of products that you're mixing, you're gonna have less chance of incompatibility. 
Now, I'd be remiss as a pesticide safety educator if I didn't uh, talk about this. So when you're mixing pesticides together, you have to follow the strictest label, okay? And I'm sure you've heard of this, um, but let's just take an example here. So you've got product A, and product A requires a REI of eight hours, and product B is four hours, okay? So product A is a little more strict here. And then product A requires chemical resistant glove, gloves and product B requires those gloves, but also protective eyewear and a respirator. So when we're mixing these two together, you know, what REI are we going to be expecting and what level of PPE? Well, it's gonna be the strictest from each thing. So, you know, when you mix things together, basically the hazards posed by each pesticide are still present, okay? So whatever hazards there were that, that require product A to have the eight hour REI, that's still there, right? And um, the same thing with, for product B, you know, maybe there was a respiratory concern, maybe like an inhalation hazard of some sort, that's still gonna be true when you mix things together. So that's why you follow the strictest label. So the next way to avoid incompatibility um, is to read the label. Now, product labels can tell you a lot of different things regarding compatibility, okay? So they have statements about other products that are tested for compatibility with your pesticide, uh, the order in which to add products, recommendations for tank mix agitation, products not to mix, sensitivities to temperature, warnings about pH or water hardness, recommended carrier volume, and whether you need to uh, tank mix an adjuvant. Okay, so all of those things can be on the label. But I do want you to keep in mind that compatibility issues are only sometimes and not always mentioned on the label. So in red here, I'm just gonna give you one example. Uh, and that's, you know, this example of other products. So sometimes the label will list other products tested for compatibility with your product, right? But they don't always do it. Um, so companies will test formulations with other products that applicators might apply during the season, but they do not account for every possible tank mix. Okay, and so, um, you know, this is just an example that you really got to make sure to, um, <clears throat> you know, keep in mind that that's not always going to be on the label, right? So really, when it comes down to it, you're the one that's responsible for knowing that the products in your tank are compatible. And hopefully what we're talking about today will help with that. So one of the major reasons that mixtures become incompatible or we see incompatibility issues is that products were mixed in the incorrect order. So mixing order is really important to understand. So let's start by talking about mixing order with water as your carrier, okay? And we're gonna to touch on fertilizer as your carrier next. But we're gonna start with water here. Um, okay, so the first thing to do like I just stressed, is to read and follow any instructions on the label and contact the manufacturer or you can contact our program with any questions, okay? So if the label touches on mixing at all, you have to follow what the label said. If the label doesn't talk about, you know, the mixing order, then there's kind of this generic order that I'm going to present to you, okay? So this is the generic order if your label doesn't say anything else, okay? It's kind of a rule of thumb procedure here. So what you're going to do is you're going to agitate liquid products in their containers uh, as per the label instructions to ensure that they're thoroughly mixed before you add them to the tank. Then you're going to add your water to the tank and usually recommend about 50% of the required volume. And then you're going to start agitation of that tank before you even add the first product. And you're going to continue agitation throughout the mixing process. And then you want to add products to your tank in order based on formulation. So in blue here, I'm gonna give you the order, the formulation order, okay? So this is not otherwise specified in the label, this is the order you're gonna follow. So first you want to add water soluble bags, okay? Then you wanna add your dry formulations, including dry flowables and soluble granules. And this is because these formulations must be mixed with water carrier with moderate agitation. You want those particles to break apart and the surfactants to dissolve. And remember, if you follow the mixing order that we just talked about, you already have been agitating the water, okay? So um, that will already be starting. Now, you wanna make sure to give your dry formulations enough wait time to properly mix with the water. And part of this is that you really should be only adding one of these at a time. So you wanna add the dry products one at a time and then wait for each of them to disperse before you add the next one. And this will give time for them to mix 
And also then if you encounter incompatibility, you're going to lose less product, okay? Because you'll, you'll catch it early. You're not going to have to mix them all at once. With the water-soluble packets, you want to visually ensure that those bags have fully dissolved and the product has dispersed, okay? And kind of the rule of thumb for each of these dry formulations is about three to five minutes, but this can really vary a lot. And we're going to touch on this later in the talk. Um, but, you know, one of the factors that can change that wait time is the temperature of the water. The next thing that can be added is the dry or liquid ammonium sulfate. After this step, you could add the dry or solid anti-drift agents and then the compatibility agents and anti-foamers. You're going to want to wait two to three minutes after you add the compatibility agents and anti-foamers before you go on to the next step. Now, while we have compatibility agents and anti-foamers as step five in this generic order, you want to keep in mind that um, they're not necessarily subject to a typical mixing order protocol. So you really want to check for those uh, defoamers and um, the compatibility agents and see if the label says anything about when to add them. And especially with the anti-foamers, you know, you're kind of putting those in, a lot of times you want to put those in throughout the mixing process. Um, so yeah, just make sure to check the labels there. Next up, you're going to add all liquid formulations that have dispersed active ingredients, such as suspension concentrates, SUSPO emulsions, emulsions in water, microcapsules, and blowables. And so this picture shows a suspension in water on the left. The next thing you do is if you're planning to add emulsifiable concentrates or ECs to your mixture, you'll want to add polymer-based drift retardants first in step seven. So you're going to add those liquid drift retardants and that allows the EC formulation uh, to absorb water and avoid clumping. Okay, so then next you would add those remaining liquid formulations, which include the emulsifiable concentrates and also oil dispersions and salt solutions or soluble liquids. And because the ECs are oil or solvent-based products, they require more time to disperse throughout the solution. The picture shown here shows an emulsion in water on the right. So often emulsions appear milky. Okay, next you're gonna add any remaining adjuvants such as crop oil concentrates, high surfactant oil concentrates, methylated seed oils, non-ionic surfactants, spreader stickers, and water conditioning agents. And then you're going to add micronutrients and liquid fertilizers. Okay, so now that you know the order to mix, let's talk about why it's so important that things are mixed in this order, if not otherwise stated in the label. So it really comes down to formulation and the properties of the products with these specific formulation types. And I highlighted those in yellow here. So as we mentioned, dry formulations require agitation. The particles must break apart and must dissolve in water. Suspensions um, such as Suspo emulsions and suspension concentrates are suspended in water with a thickener or premixed with oils. And that oil often stays on the tank surface once you add those, okay? And then emulsifiable concentrates, uh, they contain surfactants in their formulation that keep the oil droplets small. So we're kind of, we're talking about two different things here. We're talking about something that needs to disperse in water and it's dry. And then we're talking about, you know, other products that have oils or thickeners in them. And so you can imagine that if we were to add the uh, dry ingredients second, what would happen is they would hit that oil that's already on top of the tank, and then that oil would coat them, right? Then they're going to sink down to the bottom. They're not going to be able to interact and disperse in the water. Um, and so that is why you want to add those dry ingredients first. So after you add the products in this order, the next thing you do when you're mixing is you're going to add the remaining water. You're going to continue agitation until the tank mix appears uniform. And then you want to measure the pH and water hardness to determine the proper levels of water conditioners or ammonium sulfate that you might need to add if the pH is out of range. And while it's always a good rule of thumb to check the pH after you've mixed everything, you want to keep in mind that pH adjusters are not always added at the end, and the label will tell you when to add them, so you might have to add it at a different time during the mixing process. We're going to talk about pH and also water hardness um, a little bit later on in the talk. So we talked about the mixing order here, but it's important to stress that this is the order to follow only if the product labels do not have their own instructions for mixing. I think I've said that a couple times here, but I want to give you an example. 
So my example is SendStar. And I heard from a New York State Extension Associate with the Cornell Cooperative Extension Vegetable Program, uh, Christy Hoptig, that this new product, um, SendStar, you know, for control of onion thrips on onion, among other sites and pests, had some tank mixing issues. And what was happening is it was forming into a glob that had to be disposed of. And, you know, we couldn't be sure exactly what the source of these tank mixing issues was. But when you look at the tank mixing order on the SenStar label, you can see that it doesn't follow the generic mixing order that I just showed you for most pesticides. So in fact, it jumps around quite a bit and you can see the numbers I have here, you know, correspond to the generic mixing order. So you can see that SenStar label requires you to add oil dispersions in the third step. And typically this wouldn't happen until the eighth step under the generic mixing order. So things like this are exactly why it's really important to read the label to avoid incompatibility. So, so far we've just been talking about mixing with water, but what if your carrier is fertilizer? What adjustments should you make? So most pesticide products are actually designed to be used with water, okay? And water tends to be a better carrier than for those products and tank mixtures. One of the problems is that liquid fertilizers are essentially a concentrated salt solution. And so there's gonna be less water available to help disperse your dry formulations. So incompatibility is more likely to occur when you have fertilizer as your solution. Um, and then the salts can also mix with inert ingredients in your product. So knowing this, um, it makes sense that you see some changes to the mixing order with fertilizer. So first you're gonna see that you should always conduct a jar test with fertilizer as your carrier uh, to avoid that incompatibility. Also, when you're using for letter carriers, you never want to pre-mix crop protection products in an inductor. And some products are not designed to be added directly to liquid fertilizer mixtures. That's important to know. Um, similar to water carrier, you wanna make sure to agitate the fertilizer mixture before adding the ingredients, but it's even more important with fertilizer because things are less likely to disperse as compared to water. Um, also, with fertilizer, you always want to check for incompatibilities after mixing because they're more likely to happen. And, you know, there's not a big change here to the uh, order that you want to add your products um, in terms of, you know, formulation, but you'll see that you are encouraged to make these pre-slurries, okay? So with fertilizer, you want to make pre-slurries in water um, with these dry products before you put them into the tank. And that helps them dissolve before they even go into the fertilizer carrier. So let's talk about pre-slurries a little bit more. Uh, here, these two pictures on the right show an example of a dry herbicide being added directly to urea and ammonium nitrate on the top versus being mixed in a pre-slurry with water and then added to the fertilizer carrier on the bottom. And you can see that, you know, that pre-slurry made a huge difference in terms of dispersion. Uh, why are there still layers here? Well, you know, this hasn't been agitated yet. Okay, so that would help get rid of the layers. <laughs> but you can see pre slurries are really important for fertilizer carriers. And remember, when you're mixing a pre slurry, you want to reduce exposure. Okay, there's going to be an inhalation hazard with those dry ingredients. Um, there's going to be increased risk of splashing and sloshing because you're mixing in an open bucket. So pay attention to label language um, and, you know, make sure to wear. PPE, including gloves, eye and skin protection in case of splashing. And take extra care when you pour that into the tank. So now that we've talked uh, about the mixing order for both water and fertilizer, let's discuss the three main things you wanna be aware of. So we're gonna talk about mixing correctly. And the first thing we'll talk about is carrier volume. So just like when you're adding sugar to your tea, right? If you don't have enough water, that sugar is gonna precipitate out and not dissolve, and it'll end up at the bottom of your cup. So this is similar with pesticides, okay? And so you have to make sure to add the right amount of water so pesticides will dissolve. Otherwise, you're gonna get product clumping at the bottom. Uh, typically, the directions on the label state that the tank should be half full of water and three fourths full of fertilizer before you add the first product. Next, let's go, let's talk about wait time. And we already went over wait time a little bit, um, but you just wanna make sure to check that each of your products have mixed and had enough time to mix before you add the next one. You wanna agitate those products uh, before you add another product 
especially when the active ingredients do not disperse or suspend quickly in water. And keep in mind that a product may appear to have dispersed when it actually hasn't completely dissolved. So even though it appears dissolved, it actually might need a little more time. Um, and then note that mixing time can be a lot slower when water is colder. We're going to talk about that in a second. Finally, let's discuss agitation. So you want to agitate your tank mixtures moderately before and during spray application. So what do I mean by moderate agitation? Well, if you're doing moderate agitation, you're going to be able to see that top layer of your mixture moving when you look into the tank. If it looks like boiling water, that's too much agitation. Why is it so important to not over or under agitate? Okay, if you over agitate, what you're going to get is dry product formulations will foam when they remain at the top and they'll swell and sink. Um, and that can lead to uneven dispersion or even clogged and stopped pumps. You can also get uh, pesticides dislodging from their surfactants, and this can destabilize the mixture and you can get clumping and cottage cheese. And then anti-drift agents can shear um, if things are over agitated, and that will lead to diminishing effectiveness during the course of the application. So moderate agitation and also adding that anti-foaming agent should help ensure that products are dispersed without foaming. Now you can also under mix your products and under agitate them. And what happens then is that you're gonna see things settling out over time, just like you'd see with Italian salad dressing breaking into layers, right? And if particles remain settled out for too long, it can be difficult or impossible to resuspend them. This can lead to obstructive hoses or piping. Uh, and for liquid active ingredients, before you add them, you wanna check the container of the storage tank to make sure that mixture is mixed in the tank, right? Before you even add it, or sorry, in the container, before you even add it to the tank. And this should help keep things even distributed. So I just wanna give you an agitation example. And this is from a professor in plant pathology and microbiology. His name is uh, Dr. David Rosenberger. And he was using Nordex 75 WG. It's a fungicide for select tree and vine crops and field and veg crops and greenhouse and ornamental. So you can see that the Nordox label language, um, it states agitate the mixture to maintain a uniform suspension. And David ran into problems trying to apply this product with poor agitation, okay? So the product settled to the bottom of the tank. It remained as a sludge after the liquid was sprayed out. And so in David's case, he said, just reviewing that statement on the label or even a 10 to 15 minute jar test would have forewarned him of the settling problems beforehand. And we're gonna talk about jar tests later on. So the next thing you wanna think about is the properties of your carrier. And those can greatly influence compatibility. We're first going to talk about pH. So pH just measures the degree to which a substance is acidic or basic. So lemon juice, for example, has a pH of two. It's pretty acidic. Um, ammonia has a pH of 12 and it's more basic. And then water is supposed to have a pH that's close to neutral or seven but we're going to talk about how this is not always true. So most pesticides perform best if your carrier's pH is you know, four to 6.5 or so, okay? So they do better in slightly acidic conditions. Uh, one exception would be the sulfonylureal herbicides. And they perform best at a slightly basic um, pH of seven to eight. When your pH is out of range for your particular pesticide, uh, products can fall out of solution, they can degrade and decompose, and this will happen faster if the pH is more extreme or the temperature is higher. And they can also lose their electrical charge, and this can reduce the product penetration into weeds, um, so reduce efficacy. So clearly it's really important that your pH be optimal for pesticides to be effective and to ensure they're compatible. How do you make sure that the pH is addressed properly when you're tank mixing? Okay, I don't want you to get overwhelmed by this chart, but I want you to realize that, you know, the pH of your water source can be really variable. And so this was a chart from a study that was done in 1986. Um, and basically what it's showing is pH for different water sources in the fruit growing regions of New York State. Okay, so you have these different regions and you can see the pH ranges. And what I want you to focus on is really just that the range is so variable in some of these similar regions. And then across the season, you can also see that uh, you see a difference in the pH range, you know, from summer to fall, to spring in these same areas. Okay, so pH can shift both seasonally and you know, within the same place. And a lot of times these shifts, especially in surface water, um, can be because of sediments and microorganisms and minerals that are in flux. 
Okay, but the bottom line is just don't assume that you know the pH, even if you tested it, you know, last year, okay? You need to be testing your water source really frequently. And so you wanna measure the pH of your water sources um, several times throughout the season. You wanna test your water probably a couple of weeks before your spray regime begins. And that'll give you time to kind of evaluate your water, make sure you know which products will be optimal with your water source, and also which pH adjusters or adjuvants you might wanna have on hand. And to measure pH, you can use an electronic pH meter or pH dye strips. And both of those can be found uh, pretty easily online. Also, uh, labels may direct you to measure pH at different times during the mixing process, okay? But you always wanna measure pH after mixing. And then you wanna add your pH adjusters if you need to adjust the pH with care, okay? pH adjusters like water conditioners or adjuvants, um, you know, they might be prohibited by the label and sometimes just specific ones are prohibited. So you wanna make sure that what you add is effective and compatible with your product. Acidifiers can be, uh, they can lower the pH of the tank. Sometimes they can lower it too much, okay? And that can cause your active ingredients to precipitate out of solution or even volatilize. Oh, hi. Hello? Karen, I think that you are, I'm just gonna mute Karen here, unless you had a question. All right. <laughs> um, so you wanna keep in mind that the label may require adding, adding the conditioner first, or at some other time during the mixing process. Okay, so don't assume that you always add at the end. And you should be aware of product degradation over time as well with different pHs, okay? So an active ingredient can become ineffective after 10 hours when the pH is five, but it can only last you know, two minutes at a pH of nine, okay? And these aren't exact numbers I'm giving you, but it really can be dramatically different. Um, so Purdue University's uh, extension publication that I was looking over shares these following rules of thumb uh, for most pesticides, okay? So if your mixture is, you know, 3.5 to 6 pH, you're going to want to apply that mixture within 12 to 24 hours. If your pH is a little closer to neutral, you want to apply it within one to two hours. And if your pH is more than seven, you want to apply that immediately. And remember, this rule of thumb is only for uh, you know, most pesticides, we talked about how most pesticides do well um, and the pH is a little more acidic. So the sulfonylureal herbicides uh, wouldn't match these timeframes. But this just gives you an idea that, you know, things can really uh, degrade over time. And the best rule of thumb, of course, is to just mix right before you apply. You don't have to worry about any of this. <laughs> um, the label will not always mention water pH, okay? So that doesn't mean it won't cause an incompatibility problem. What's gonna happen often is the manufacturer just might assume that your water pH will be in a normal range. And they may not be able to warn you, you know, about an out of range pH issue because they're not assuming that you have an out of range pH. And you wanna avoid mixing pesticides with radically different pH requirements. Uh, because what would happen is that you're always trying to condition for one pesticide and that would mean that you're kind of reducing the efficacy and performance of the other, right? If they're, if they're radically different needs for the pH range. So for instance, LI700 can help acidify spray water. So products like Captan and Imidan don't degrade. So that's useful for Captan and Imidan. But if you were to mix uh, LI700 with copper fungicides, for instance, for instance um, that can cause phytotoxicity at low pH, right? So you really have to be careful um, and you should just avoid mixing pesticides that have radically different pH requirements. So next we'll talk about water hardness. Another factor that can influence compatibility is water hardness. So negatively charged pesticide molecules have a tendency to attach or attract to positively charged cations that are naturally found in water. So these include things like aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, and magnesium. And pesticides that bind with these minerals can actually precipitate out of solution, or they might be less likely to enter the target pests. So weak acid herbicides like glyphosate or dodine or 2,4-D and dicamba are more susceptible to incompatibility in hard water. And you can see from this map I have in the US that the natural concentration of these minerals in hard water, so you know, water hardness, uh, red is like the most hard water, right? It really varies across the country. You can see the hardest water is sort of in the middle of the country, uh, 
a little bit more out west from us. But you can also, if you look at New York State, there's some red parts of our state, okay? And there's a lot of variation with across our state. So you really wanna be uh, careful that you know what the water hardness is where you are. So let's take a pause here and think about why would water hardness render pesticides ineffective? So what I'm showing here is uh, two containers. The one on the left contains distilled water. Uh, so it has zero water hardness. And the one on the right contains hard water, a lot of minerals concentration, okay? And a material that mimics glyphosate is going to be added to both these bottles. And you'll notice that the water on the left remains clear. And this indicates that the added product is in solution. Okay, so that's what you want. <laughs> the water on the right is cloudy. And what this is indicating is that the calcium has actually bound to the glyphosate mimic, okay? And so if the mixture on the right were to be applied, there would not be any glyphosate available to act on your weeds because it would have already bound to the hard water. Even if you're adding the full rate to your tank, you're just not gonna get any efficacy because it's bound to the hard water. And of course, if you think about this, this is like on a continuum, right? So if you have a really high concentration, um, you're gonna see something like this where it's completely ineffective, but there might be uh, different degrees of efficacy depending on how hard your water is. So to avoid water hardness issues, you'll want to measure water hardness with commercially available water testing kits. Uh, and if your water is out of the normal range, water softeners like ammonium sulfate or AMS and ammonium thiosulfate can counter the effects of hardness. But you wanna be careful because adding AMS to things like EC formulations can sometimes result in phytotoxicity and hopefully uh, you know, it should be on the label language. So here's an example. Uh, this is Engenia. This product is an herbicide listed for DT soybean in New York. And there's instructions to use a conditioning agent if your water iron contents above 500 ppm. So you have hard water, you're like, all right, I'm gonna use this conditioning agent, but the label dictates not to use the more common ones. So AMS or UAN, and instead um, you have to use conditioners that are pre-approved for Engenia. So you actually have to go look those up, right? And I think they're in a different section of the label, but this is really important. Also in this label, there's a statement that talks about noting um, that the pH buffering agent that's required for this product, okay? So there's a, you, you know, this is another exemption of why there's so many uh, exceptions and complications. This is another example of why you have to check the label. We're also gonna talk about water turbidity. So water hardness was when negatively charged pesticides were attracted to cations and weren't available to act in your pests. With water turbidity, what you have is positively charged pesticides that are attracted to and bind um, to negatively charged particles in your water. So what are the negatively charged particles that are in your water? Well, they're things like soil sediment. So in general, just do not mix pesticides with water that is visibly muddy or murky, because this will lead to incompatibility or could. Um, sometimes a label will talk about turbidity issues. You probably can't see this as well, but this is glyphosate plus, and the label states, reduced results may occur if water containing soil is used, such as visibly muddy water or water from ponds and ditches that is not clear. And last, when we're thinking about carrier properties, let's talk about temperature. So water temperature influences the rate at which products dissolve, disperse, emulsify, and flow. And more materials will dissolve in warmer water than in colder water. Uh, you can see that, you know, this diagram here, the cold water is just not moving as fast. So it's not gonna be able to bump into your pesticides as much and interact with them as much. Uh, and that's why they don't dissolve as much as they do in warm water. When you have cold, Colder water, dry and liquid flowable formulations will take longer to disperse. Um, ECs, crop oil, and seed oil formulations will form gels and kind of distribute unevenly in the tank. Um, and water-soluble packets may not dissolve as easily. They may take a really long time to dissolve. So how do you avoid compatibility issues with cold water? If you're working with colder water, you'll want to agitate the water more. You're going to wait for longer for those products to dissolve. And you maybe even want to create pre-slurries in warmer water to ensure that the products are distributing evenly. So you put them in warm water first before you add them to the cold tank water. And uh, keep in mind that temperature is usually not addressed on the label um, because it's assumed that you're working with water that's within the right temperature range. So how cold is too cold? Unfortunately, there's not enough research on this for me to really give you an exact range. Hopefully more comes out. 
But what I can show you uh, is research out of Purdue, which is summarized in this table. So what they did in the study is they mixed the, you know, the following herbicides here with different temperature water. And the extra show where the herbicide performance was reduced. And maybe it wasn't reduced completely, but you know, it was reduced in some way for at least some weed species. And the checks sh show where the products were effective. And so you, even though they only tested four products, this information you know, could help you think about things because what you're seeing is that you know, if the water's at 72, um, these herbicides were effective and then it wasn't when the water was as cold as 41. And so as your water gets farther away from 72 and closer to 41, you're gonna to wanna to think about increasing agitation, waiting longer for products to dissolve and creating those pre-slurries in warm water. One of the most important tools that you have at your disposal to avoid incompatibility is to test before you mix in the tank with a small amount of product, with a jar test. You're probably familiar with these, but you should always conduct a jar test if you're mixing products that you have not mixed before because you don't know if those will be incompatible. You don't wanna experiment with an untested tank mix in the day of application. You should also do periodic jar tests with products that you actually have mixed already. This is because manufacturers can often change the inert ingredients that are in their products. And um, sometimes another factor such as your carrier pH or water hardness could change over time. And that might impact compatibility. The jar test could actually catch that for you, right? Remember, there's no recovery once you mix things in the tank if you're having incompatibility issues um, or often no recovery, right? The jar test can really save you from losing product and having a mess to clean up. When you do a jar test, you're looking for the following indicators of incompatibility. And we talked about, you know, it's really hard to flag chemical incompatibility. You often can't see it. But sometimes the mixture will give off heat. Um, or sometimes you're going to see something looking cloudy, kind of like with that glyphosate and hard water example that I showed you. So you might be able to catch chemical incompatibilities. Certainly, you're going to be able to catch physical incompatibilities. Um, you know, you're going to see layers forming or the mixture isn't uniform if particles are floating or foaming. Maybe you're going to see residue accumulating on the sides of the container or material that just takes a really long time to, to um, settle to the bottom or larger particles are present that would not fit through your screens, filters, or nozzles. When you conduct the jar test, you're going to use the exact same water that you use in the tank uh, because, you know, we know that water pH hardness, uh, turbidity can all make a difference. And then you know, the labels usually tell you uh, how to do a jar test, but it usually involves measuring cups and glass or plastic containers and don't reuse those for other purposes, right? Just for pesticides. Uh, and you can purchase chemical compatibility test kits online if you need to with all the supplies needed. To conduct the test, you're gonna mix the appropriate amounts of carrier and pesticide. You're gonna make sure you use enough water and you would start by adding what, you know, the carrier that's needed uh, about one fifth to one half carrier needed. You're gonna mix in the proportionate amount of pesticides in the recommended order. Then you're gonna add the rest of the carrier and you invert the container after adding a product. Once you've mixed your products in the jar, you're gonna let it stand for at least 30 minutes. Now, if you can let it stand for longer, uh, that'll give you more information. If a pesticide were to degrade overnight, for instance, if your jar test can go overnight, uh, and maybe you know that's how long your mixture is going to be in the tank. That would really let you know if you're going to have an incompatibility issue. And to drive home why you need enough water, here on the left we have, um, you know, pesticide products Touchdown and Flexstar mixed with liquid AMS and water. On the left we only have 25 milliliters of water, and on the right we have the recommended 80 milliliters of water. You know, just based on the proportions, right? And so if you don't use the right proportion, you can see that. The one on the left is much less close to being compatible than the one on the right when enough water was added. All right, so we're getting close to the end here, but I'm gonna kind of throw a, a bunch of uh, extra tips at you here. So I want you to think about, you know, compatibility is really holistic. We've been going into each little aspect of it, but actually it's really important to look at things overall. Um, and there's many things to, to take into account all at once. So I have an example here and it's Captan. And it's a fungicide label for fruit ornamentals. Um, and what you can see is that you know, the label warns that mixing Captan with alkaline materials like spray lime and Bordeaux mix can reduce the fungicidal activity of the product. Um, and this is because the liquid lime sulfur has an extremely high pH, so it can degrade Captan. So that's the first thing you wanna watch out for. 
Then the label mentions that you should not apply captan close to oil sprays. And the reason why is because the oil can actually make your plant cuticle more permeable. And this means that captan could enter the plant and cause phytotoxicity. Next, the label states that there might be problems with captan and phytotoxicity and those problems, sorry, the problems with captan and phytotoxicity can get worse after an extended period of cloudy and damp weather. So you're gonna to have to look out for the weather. And the reason why this is, is because you know, new leaves are gonna be growing when it's cloudy and damp. Um, and then those new leaves will have less cuticular waxes. It'll be easier for captan to accidentally penetrate and damage the plant. Also the label will discourage the use of spreaders that cause excessive wetting. And this is because much like with the oils, adding adjuvants that increase penetration into the plant can cause damage to your plant from phytotoxicity. And then finally, the label talks about organophosphates and sulfur. Um, for example, flint, which contains phosphate in its formulation, when it's sprayed around the same time as captain, it can result in phytotoxicity. So this just shows how many things you have to keep in mind when you're trying to avoid incompatibility. And like with many things that are this complicated, there's always additional rules of thumb. So I talked to some Cornell Extension, uh, Cooperative Extension educators and scientists, and I just wanna share the following tips with you. And uh, Steve, how are we doing on time? We've got, uh, we've got another 10 minutes or so. Okay, great. Yeah, so I might go a little bit over the 50 minutes, but we'll still have time for questions. Okay, so um, here's some of the additional rules of thumb. And I wanted to share these with you because you know I was talking to people that work with fruit and veg growers. So I think this is really helpful to keep in mind. Uh, so the first thing I wanna talk about is you wanna keep in mind that phytotoxicity can be specific to specific crops and cultivars, okay? So read the labels really carefully. And don't assume that things will be true across all cultivars. For example, Apogee, um, this is a product that can cause fruit cracking on empire and stamen apples, but it's safe on other cultivars. Okay, and even if you aren't tank mixing, you want to be careful with tank residues. So for example, azoxystrobin, um, will cause leaf and fruit burn on some apple cultivars, even if it's just in the slightest amount, like in parts per billion, okay? So this could be a situation where you don't clean out your tank as well as you know you hope to after spraying azoxy on pumpkins or something, right? Then you later spray an apple and there's only a tiny bit of that azoxy strobin, but it, it can damage um, the apples. You also want to make sure your ingredients are fresh. So for example, if you're an apple grower, you might know that lime absorbs carbon dioxide. And the reason why apple growers might know this is because paper bags of lime were actually traditionally placed in controlled atmosphere apple storage. And the reason why is because they absorb carbon dioxide and this reduced injury to stored apples. But now think about other uses you might have for lime. If you make Bordeaux mix with uh, spray lime and copper sulfate, imagine what might happen if you're using some of the older spray lime that you were storing in paper bags. If you didn't seal that spray lime up, it probably absorbs some carbon dioxide. And so just like with the glyphosate in the hard water example that I showed, um, you know, it will have bound to the carbon dioxide and that lime will no longer combine with the copper sulfate because it's just not going to be available. And so the copper is going to be less effective. So keep in mind how fresh your ingredients are. And then I also want to talk about name brand versus generic. I'm gonna be really careful here and say this is just anecdotal evidence, okay? There's not you know, proven studies on this or anything, but from people who have worked closely with apple and vegetable growers, what I'm hearing is that there's reports of mixing issues and also crop damage with some of your cheaper or off-brand formulations. And so the reason why is because cheaper formulations can have varying amounts of surfactant or varying quality of the inert ingredients. Okay, so even though the active ingredient is the same between the two different uh, products, the one that's off brand, um, you know, you might have to add more surfactant or uh, there's just less quality. So for example, um, with glyphosate, for instance, some of those off brand products that have glyphosate as the active ingredient might require more surfactants and that can increase the chances of glyphosate uptake and then injury to tree bark. Uh, and then also, you know, if you have a different quality of your inert ingredients, um, we're seeing some generic formulations that sometimes don't mix as well with the name brands. For instance, Bravo Weather Stick. 
And that's probably because those inert ingredients just not being as quality. And then finally, be careful uh, which products you mix with biological products, okay? Because products like fungicides, sanitizers, or bactericides can kill those biologically active ingredients. And if they're dead, they're definitely not gonna be effective against your pests. So we talked a lot about how to prevent incompatibility before you even you know, have the problem. That's your first line of defense. But what if you do run into unexpected incompatibility in your tank? What do you do? When you first notice it, you're gonna contact your dealer or product manufacturer to talk about options. Worst case scenario, they can tell you how to dispose of the solution in a way that, you know causes the least risk to you and poses the least risk to the environment and your equipment. They also might direct you to add a conditioner or an adjuvant that could improve the situation. These could be things like more water, a compatibility agent, a detergent, soap, non-ionic surfactant, or a pH adjuster. And even if that added product resolves the uh, incompatibility, it doesn't mean that your product will be effective anymore. Right? So you'll want to check with the dealer or manufacturer to know if your product will still work or if, if you just resolve the incompatibility enough to uh, not damage your equipment. And then you also want to check, is the problem isolated to your spray tank? If not, uh, you may need to dismantle your sprayer to remove any residues. So I think that that's all that I have. And I am ready to take questions. Uh, Mary, I will just say to you, thank you so much for making a very complicated subject, I think, uh, rather easy to follow. And uh, <laughs> I hope oh, people feel that way. I hope I didn't bore you all to tears. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's such an important subject, too. So I, I thought it was really fascinating, too, in terms of like the order to put things in um, and how to do that. So again, thank you for that. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.